Good afternoon, everyone. Excited to be here today to talk to you about the amazing things we're doing with natural language processing and machine learning to drive value for our clients. I'm Nate Storch, the CEO and co-founder of Amenity Analytics. What an exciting show it is today. The migration to the cloud is, is on a path that's not stoppable. In fact, I would say the migration has turned into a stampede. And one of the after effects of this has been that we're firmly entrenched in the era of big data. In today's competitive world, it's no longer an option to use a data-focused decision-making framework to drive your most important business decisions. Yet there's a problem with this. In order to make accurate decisions, so much information that you need is in text. And yet, most of this information goes unanalyzed. Why? Because today's natural language processing options fall short. Well, our mission at Amenity Analytics is to transform text into valuable assets for the benefit of you and your business, your stakeholders, and society at large. We've built a natural language processing platform trained on the language of business. We process news, regulatory filings, earnings call transcripts, research reports, and troves of internal documents for our clients. We turn that into actionable insights. We use that to drive efficiency and ultimately better decision making. And the result is a paradigm shift. From today, where only the most sophisticated organizations are able to analyze the text that they want to analyze and get the information that they need to today, where any organization can work with us to get the information that they need from text. To take a step back a little bit about amenity analytics, we have about 60 employees now, split between New York and Tel Aviv. We've raised about $26 million. We're lucky to count Intel Capital, one of the world's leading investors in AI technologies, on our cap table, as well as State of Mind Ventures, and two of our clients in the insurance space, Allstate and Star. We're a very customer-centric organization and very proud of the clients that we're working with, some of today's most sophisticated organizations. And so today, we're here to talk to you about one of our core business processes. Every day, we ingest millions of documents, which we transform into billions of data points, which we then have to turn into actionable insights. And so our question that we ask ourselves is, how do we do this in a way that produces more refined data, that's accurate, we do it at lightning speed, and at a price that doesn't break the bank? Well, my colleague Roy Penn, our VP of Engineering, is here to talk to you in more detail about exactly how we're doing this. So thank you very much. OK. Um, in, the, in Amenity, we have switched in entire infrastructure to work from Docker container base to serverless. We use the, um, Amazon offers a myriad of solutions for serverless. They, they, they offer Lambda and Kinesis and uh, Aurora and Athena and SQS and SNS. We probably used all of them, or if not, we're on our way to use all of them. And and our goals when we started our, when we initiated our, our, um, our change from our, our evolution from server full to serverless was that we're going to have to support 100x more customers, which we're on our way to do. We want to do it 100x faster, so update our data every few seconds and not minutes or hours or days, the time it usually takes to train an LP model. And we want to do it in 100x more, more data. Uh, when we started our initiative, we were processing maybe 10 or 20 streams of data. Now we're processing about 50,000 different channels. And while we do that, we want to maintain the four core uh, um, uh, methodologies for ourselves. We want to be agile, so being able to deploy as quickly as possible new solution. Right now it takes us, with the serverless infrastructure, about an hour to deploy new code. 
flexible scaling, we want to actually, at lower cost, we want to actually pay for exactly the amount of, of resources we ta that we take. A lot of time people say just pay for the resources that you use, and what they actually mean is it takes about two, two minutes to ramp up some servers. If you need a thousand of them, it takes more than that, and then there's a ramp down. And with Lambda functions, we can spin up tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of them, and we will only pay for the 100 milliseconds they actually take to ramp up, do the thing, and ramp down. And that's amazing for us. This here talks about the evolution that we've made. Our previous architecture was all Java, Docker, again on Amazon, but ECS, and we moved to Python serverless on Amazon Lambda. This is the previous one. This, every, every bucket here, every, every bubble here is a microservice. We had about 40 of them running around in a very star-shaped architecture. Moving to a streamlined, look at this. This is an architectural pattern we're really proud of. It's only enabled because of AWS's uh, uh, tools. You get every microservice has the input as, a C as an SQS some Lambda function doing something, sometimes writes to a database, and then an SNS to send it to the other uh, uh, step in line. Overall, just six microservices, they each scale up and down in order of seconds to several tens of thousands of processes. We ingest about a million documents every day, and then the output on the other side really depends on how many um, NLP models you have as a customer with us, um, on the other side, we will output several billions of data points, uh, really refined for what it is that, that our customers need. This is how a development experience look, how we built it. You got several devs, they would all develop locally or, or on the cloud, wherever, wherever their environment is. Through Git hooks, they'll deploy to an environment called ops, and that would assume role and do a stage rollout. So 10% of the users, 20%, 30%, 40%, we will keep track of errors, we will keep track of uh, optimizations of our metrics. And as we move from dev stage to production with a stage rollout, each of the developers will know that their system is doing what it's supposed to do without breaking anything else. This here is, a, is an example of how we even use the architectural pattern to do log shipment. You have tens of thousands of, of lambdas. They all send logs to, uh, to uh, CloudWatch, obviously. But if we want it all in logs or in uh, Honeycomb, we build the same mechanism called Conduit here, the same mechanism where you have SNS, SQS, Lambda log processor. So even if we have spikes in logs, everything will still flow smoothly into our logging servers. And it's so easy. This is how a, uh, how a, a YAML or an ARN um, pattern would look like. Inside that, that was uh, until now we just saw the, the ETL pro process. Inside that, there's an NLP process that we need to run. NLP is uh, notoriously known for taking a lot of CPU. We managed to break it down so that it all runs on Lambda functions. Previous NLP basis was clear NLP. This is how our NLP process generally looks like. You can see about 12 steps. Some of them are just known, like tokenizer and lemmatizer and nair tags. And some of them are more uh, specific to our use case. None of them we take off the shelf. We always have some sort of manipulation to them. In our process, we changed all of these from being dependent on Java and clear NLP in a Docker container to being dependent on Spacey. We work with Python. Whenever we need more uh, uh, optimization, we to go down to C or Cython in order to run on Lambda. Lambda functions have great limitations. You know, you barely get one CPU and a few hundreds of megabytes of RAM. You, you, can, you can pull it to three gigs, but if you do that, it's costly, and you might not get as many as you want. So you want things to be as efficient as possible. That's why you have to go, well, we had to go down to C anyway. This is an example of a linguistic pattern that we, that we one of the linguistic patterns that we try to um, extract. It says, Taranga proposed acquisition of Griffin Minerals that should be expected to close uh, in October. That is a sentence that tells us that an M&A might happen. 
And we want, to be able, we want to be able to identify sentences like this, for example. And so we would take, automatically, we would build a rule. And then we would, there's a, we would a machine that automatically generates, uh, we build code, that automatically generates C code. That runs, most of the time, we were able to go from O of n squared to O of n, or even O of 1 uh, complexity. The execution actually happens in Cython, so again, very efficient. Um, and we were able to run everything. I'll show you uh, a few examples in a, in a minute, but very optimized and all in Lambda code. So all of our, uh, of our, uh, of our NLP happens in Lambda functions. This is an architecture, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little deep dive. You can see, again, SQS task, go to Lambda. Lambda would take between three to 15 uh, seconds per large task, a few hundred milliseconds for small task, and then again, either send it to the next uh, Lambda in line, or Dynamo S3, or SNS. These are some of the results that we've got. This is the legacy uh, architecture. This is the um, serverless-based architecture. You can see model NLP model loading time used to take a few tens of seconds. Now it takes a few hundreds of milliseconds. We can accomplish that in Lambda because we, we took down the amount of RAM it requires in order to load. Lambda is very RAM sensitive. This is running the model at worst case from one minute to 10 seconds. Mostly it takes us about 100 to 500 milliseconds. And this is a big deal. Running it used to take 8 gigabytes, doesn't fit into a Lambda. Now it takes 250 megabytes. All in all combined, we can fit NLP into Lambdas that take 512 megabytes, which is essentially almost a magic number for for Lambda function. And our next, our next uh, goal in line is to do, well now, right now we do a million documents a day. We want to be able to do about a billion documents every hour. Um, by working with our uh, solutions, you'll be able to uh, delight your customers as well. So come see us. So there, the transformation was uh, uh, two phases. One is the ETL, and the other one is the NLP. ETL took us about five months to move. NLP uh, is still going on. It's about six months in. We have about two months more to go. Yeah, can you give us like one uh, example, successful example for the, your case? For example, what kind of application apply to all states? What kind of application? Can you give us like one business case, successful business case to use your technique? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, Nate here can give uh, uh, several successful business cases. So today we're analyzing uh, you know, all sorts of documents for the financial sector that our clients use in order to both drive decision making as well as automated trading decisions. So one of our specialties is earnings call transcripts, which are tricky because a lot of it is very uh, freeform text, you know, in that there's a question and answer period where it's off script, and so that text has a lot of linguistic difficulties. So being able to get very accurately, very accurately extract and analyze the specific topics and events that are being disclosed in that text presented a challenge for us, and we've been able to deliver both APIs as well as visualization type, type, uh, type of solutions that have been successful for both more quantitative uh, investment managers, as well as, uh, as well as discretionary investors, as well. A similar question: What do you extract in ten seconds per document? What What do we? What want? do you extract from the document in ten seconds? We extract. Well, the 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 easiest way to say it is whatever is interesting for the client. It could be. Uh, guidance signal, or M&A signals, or trading signals, or deceptive tone. Um, so thank you. So this is the first use case where you build the first data warehouse, extraction, transformation, loading. So then what happens when you're actually appending, creating a secondary metadata repository? How This is a unidirectional workflow that you show for optimization. Mm -hmm. What happens when your original legacy or source files are now more dynamic? They're also adding other data sources that you didn't have in the first ETL workflow. How do you guarantee this type of performance 
Uh, we, we add data sources all the time. We just, uh, every day, we add more data flows and we have to rerun maybe sometimes previous models on previous data sources. So you have to rerun a batch of, we just had over the weekend, had to run a batch of over a quarter of a billion documents. It takes about five hours. So that's my question. So if you know that only X percent is being updated from the first data warehouse installation and you now have a, a dynamic data set, yeah. how can I save on performance if I only really want to look at what changed prior to the first installation? Are you doing this in terms of creating other metadata repositories that are more dynamic? I'm not sure I'm following the question. I'll try to, I'll try to answer anyway. All of the metadata is, is um, schemaless. And so we can track all the changes we want and then reanalyze only the pieces of the data that we want to reanalyze. And so if there's a change that we think will only affect specific kind of documents, we will only pull those, so filter them out, only pull those, do some additional fine grain filtering and only run them. And when we update all the data, there's only one data lake, right? But we just update records on top of it and then you can be able to pull the last one or the last one that is actually yours because the same document can serve multiple customers and within a single customer it can serve multiple use cases. Hi, Hi. you mentioned the cost savings. It's cheaper than the new mo architecture. Oh, in terms of percentage, what's the uh, you know cost savings you, you saw that? What's the cost saving? It's about 80 to 90% cost saving. Um, per unit of measure, for per unit of data, it could be even 98%. Um, but that's the rough number. Uh, would you apply to like foreign languages, documents for? Right now, we're only English based. OK. Uh, do you offer APIs to integrate with other ap applications? APIs for data. Uh, API for the, for your application. Like say we want to integrate w with the. Uh, One of our price. products is API based. You can get all the the goodies of analysis through an API. Yes, absolutely. I actually have a question on the one minute per document. So, uh, I mean, you show a case where if you're looking for measure uh, for an M and A case, right, in a transcript, uh, is that's like for example, if you search for that in a in a transcript, that takes one minute. But let's say that you want to like search for whether the company is launching a new product. Yeah. Do you have to actually like train the model again and wait for that, or how does that actually work? So our models are built in a way that they have. They're like aggregating models, and they have different parts to them. So the same model would also would 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 analyze both, well, everything, M and A, new product launch, guidance, deception, all of that is the same. Then one minute it will include everything. 